we have a title that I think is very suitable. It must be rather good because several people said they had to come because they didn't know what it meant. <laughs> In other words, success is the accomplishment of the necessary. Now, that just sounds like a few words, but there's something behind that idea that actually there's no success unless the cause is right. To succeed in a cause that is not right is not success. Therefore, in all of our thinking, we have to work to understand the world we live in and the laws that govern it. Now, for instance, we know that the child coming into life begins to learn some ordinary things from the family. And this might be considered the home school. Beyond that is kindergarten and grammar school. Then comes high school. And then comes the university. And then, for that matter, education ceases. But there is one other school beyond the university. And if we betray that school, we're in great trouble. The Rosicrucians call this other school the College of the Holy Spirit. And all education fails unless it leads in the end to the realization of the spiritual foundations of human society. We are now suffering from the result of stopping our education before we reach the College of the Holy Spirit. We think we are here to achieve material success. There is no such a thing as material success that has any meaning. It is simply whether we are comfortable or are uncomfortable on the journey through life. The most important thing is the journey, not the comfort. And we've been working too long on the problem of the comfortable way of passing through 70 or 80 years. This is not what was intended or the reason and proper cause of life. Therefore, it seems needed or at least useful to devote a little time to the study of this problem. Actually, to begin with then, let us remember one very interesting thing. The school of the Holy Spirit is the school of nature. It is the school of the immutable laws and principles that govern all things. Whether we want to or not, we are in that school. Some are trying desperately to play hooky, and the result has been difficult all the way along. Others do not know that the school exists. Some deny that it exists. But the unknowing and the denying all lie down in the same earth. There is no achievement, no security, no success apart from the experience of adjustment to universal procedures. Therefore, in this emergency that is now arising in the world, it is especially important and useful to become aware of something of these causations with which we must all work. Now, to begin with in our little problem, we are going to start with the idea of the great text of nature. And the great text of nature in this case will be the text of human nature because we are part of that division of nature which is concerned with the maturing of humanity as a group or a class of creatures. The school of the Holy Spirit, as it relates to mankind, therefore, is a school based upon uh, tradition, observation, as Bacon says, and experimentation. The greatest cause of our delay and difficulty is our refusal to accept the evidence that nature provides. We consider the human evidence very important. Natural elements are evidence, something to be avoided if possible. But in this problem, there is no avoiding the facts of life. So we begin with considering the problem of nature as the final teacher. Now, humanity exists in this world as a result of three basic conditions, circumstances, or realities which are undeniable. These things are unchanging, immutable, and must be obeyed. And those who are born to obey are not born to change the laws of obedience. 
we are all dependent upon three bestowals of nature, air, water, and food. These are the fundamentals of material existence. There is no avoiding them. We can live only a few hours uh, without air. We can live only a few days without water. Maybe we can live a month or two without food. But the physical life of the individual is geared to these necessary allotments which nature has provided. Therefore, the most precious things in the world are these basics. These are what we must depend on from here on. We must depend upon these nation's benevolences forever and ever, or as long as we exist in a mortal state. So we begin to say, are we taking the greatest possible care of these commodities? Are we measuring success in terms of acceptance and obedience? Or are we trying to uh, use success as a term to describe ignoring the universe of which we are a part, ignoring the laws and principles upon which we live for existence? Well, let's see, what are we doing with water? We are making a great sewer out of it. We are using it as a repository for all the waste chemicals of nuclear research. We are doing everything we can to burden it into the future. We are sinking nu nuclear material into the oceans where we are perfectly certain that the containers will ultimately corrode and the material will be flown into the ocean. Everywhere we are perverting the element of water. We are using it without any consideration for its essential meaning. We are not protecting it. We are not wisely guiding it. We are using it to receive the sewerage of a great human structure. We are also using it for the waste of all our industrial and research and scientific procedures. And water is a little bit difficult. We also know that water does purify itself by cyclic terms if we give it a chance. But when we burden it more than it can carry, water becomes a danger. And in many parts of the world now, we are struggling to survive the misuse of the water element. Then we come and we do another one that's very important, air. If anyone lives in Southern California, we know what this is all about. We realize that smog, congestion, and the constant charging of the atmosphere with the products and byproducts of industrial research and manufacture, that we are constantly using air wrongly. We are using it as, an e as a medium for esca escaping the consequences of misuse. We are corroding the air. We are causing it to become an instrument of pain and sorrow. We are creating allergies. We are doing everything possible to make air a dangerous element rather than a great help. And the third problem is, of course, nutrition. We depend for life upon food. And at the present time, our food is not safe. We are constantly being warned of the use of dangerous chemicals for the preservations of foods, but do not preserve the human body. So we have all these things as mistaken uses. Now comes the question, what would happen if we tried to use them correctly? Well, that would be pretty serious stuff. The average individual would rather live half a lifetime, half sick, than face the dangers, sorrows, misfortunes, and corruptions of integrity in actual operation. We are afraid of the truth. We know that the truth would undermine nearly any institution that we have because very few of them are based upon a solid foundation of integrity. To uh, dis dispose of our present rules would result in chaos. And if we tried to put in more important and better rules, it would affect economically most of the people adversely. We are afraid of loss, of money, but not afraid to lose our own lives. Therefore, we are constantly suffering 
We are paying huge hospital bills. We are mortgaging our futures in order to maintain a status symbol, a way of life which is not good to begin with, but for which we feel we have no escape. We look back on all of those nations that have gone before, and we should pause. Now, when you mention the past to certain moderns, they become very indignant. We shouldn't think of the past. The past is dead. What we don't realize, though, is that we are dying with it. In a few years, we will be part of the past. There is a great deal we have to consider here. So we go back to the past and we'll find out that every civilization uh, that fell, fell because it broke natural law. It broke natural law by avarice, uh, by all kinds of ambitions, by the misuse of power, uh, by all of the abuses of beliefs and doctrines and religions and sciences that made up the past for humanity. Many of these institutions were dangerous and some of them are mortal. And the past is now mostly dust in the deserts of the world. So the past becomes, however, a very valuable teacher. The past tells us what happens when we break the rules. And it also reminds us that for the most part, so-called civilization has been a progressive breaking of rules in which each step of the way by means of a power pressure causes the individual to believe that he can live contrary to the laws governing the universe in which he exists. So we are now coming to the verge of another world cycle. We are coming to the beginning of the 21st cycle of the Western life. Are we prepared for this? What are we going to give to the 21st century? Are we going to give them great organizations? Are we going to keep on buying and selling billion dollar corporations from one nation to another? Are we going to continue to build munitions to protect us from each other? Are we going to continue to maintain high costs, high living, and all of the exaggerations that we now regard as perfectly proper and normal? If what we take into the next century is merely the continuation of what we have now and our processes and policies are the same as they are today, the 21st century will go down as a still worse institution than the one we have today. We are going to have to build some kind of an integrity into this thing or it will not survive the misuse of rules. We look around us all the time and we see what we are doing to the ecology we see that what we are doing to the natural resources, not long ago it was estimated that our petroleum supply would last for another 40 years. After that, what are we going to do? Oh, everyone is perfectly happy. We'll find some other way of getting around. Well, one way would be bicycles. <laughs> we're not going to be able to get around. Everyone is thinking of all, oh, we're going to have new atomic power we're going to live in a paradise which will permit us to break rules forever and be more comfortable as a result. There's something that's a little strange about this philosophy and it doesn't come from when any well-established system. It is the optimism of the individual who is reasonably sure that he won't be here anyway by the time these things fall on his head. So we now have to think a little bit about what we're going to pass on to the future. Are we going to pass on the most mammoth debt that has ever been accumulated? And of this debt, what is it? This debt is money. Where is money in nature? Money in nature, as, far as Mark Twain once pointed out, is nothing. Heaven isn't interested in dollars and cents. Profit is a loss. Heaven is interested in the survival of a species of life that was created and ordained to be perpetuated. And in the old scriptural writings, this life was placed in a beautiful garden and was made to be the gardener in order that the gardener, guardian might be proper and all would be well done. There were rules set down. And uh, what have we done? We've broken all of them. And we do it with a good nature. We, have to, we begin to feel as though the rules that were set by the gods uh, perished 
when man took over the rulership of the universe. But he's having trouble trying to claim this universal rulership because every one of many dictators wants the job and they kill each other to get the job. And James the Cain and Abel will come back to us again. The struggle for power. And in this struggle for power, the universe is absolutely against all monopoly. The universe is for honesty and integrity. And without it, it will not reward any living creature. We see already what we are getting into. We realize that we are now in short supply. We know, for example, that by means of World War II, we have so depleted many of our natural resources that we have probably taken at least 20 to 25 years off of our future expectancy for any of the various elements involved. We actually shortened our futures by wars. We allow complete waste, not only waste but savage waste. We not only have wars but revolutions. And in the last 50 years, we have managed to murder off probably uh, five or six hundred million human beings in one way or another, not all with a gun, some with suffering, some with starvation, some with sickness, some with just pain, discouragement, but many away absolute frightful cruelty. And many peoples have turned upon their own kind and destroyed them for the sake of an almighty dollar or another step forward on the ladder of dictatorship. So all these things are now in part of our heritage that have to go on to the future. And it looks pretty miserable. Now against all of this, however, there are certain good signs. We are not left completely without leadership. And we realize that human beings down inside of themselves are perfectly aware of the fact that they are more than merely pawns in a game. The average human being does not really believe that he was created simply to die for somebody he never heard of and who is doing nothing good for anybody. We all want to see a better world. But as we said in the subject, which I think is important, that this success in this search is due to the ability to determine value and having found it to live according to it. And without this value sense, we will not have security. Now, we will probably, we probably lost 20 years or 25 years of, la of the next century's uh, materials by wasting war in this century. We will cut down the, abil of the ability to pass on to others resources which we have wasted hating each other. And what is done of the hate? They all have gone to sleep in the earth and nothing remembers them or remained of them but sketch, sketchy history which is subject to constant revisions. So we have no, no uh, foundation here for any particular security. Now we also, however, are terribly afraid. We are desperately fearful that if we make any major change in our policies it will result in impoverishment. We are quite certain that in order to maintain the high standard of living, we must continue the present processes. But actually, we are not maintaining the high standard of living. We are maintaining the high standard of dying. We will probably be among the richest in the graveyard, but there will not do much good to anybody. Now, we are afraid to definitely to change these various monopolies, industrial, financial, and political, for fear that will cause our standard of living to be reduced. We will not make so much money. We will not have so much uh, say politically. But what will we have in security doesn't seem to interest anyone. For the reason I think very few people have ever had any kind of security. We have inherited the miseries of the past and are pa planning to pass them on to the future. And with these miseries, the great hope is that we're going to have a big time while it lasts. This is the secret of the success of cocaine and heroin. No future, but a big time right now. Here our young people are doing the same thing. No one is really thinking about solving problems. They're thinking about fun, fun generation, a generation of extravagance, 
a generation that is devoid of foundations and a system supporting it that doesn't want foundations because foundations will affect profits and loss. So we now have to face some of these things in the in terms that we can face them. There are things we can't do as individuals, but there is a power that will do them. But we can be a part of the power that sees what needs to be done and will try in what ways that we can to fit our own personal life and destiny into the plan as it should be. We can all be part of it in improvement of the situation. And among the improvements, already ecology is coming in. People are becoming aware of these things. We are becoming more and more aware of the danger of allowing species of life to become extinct. We are coming to realize more and more how we are changing land into desert and desert into condominiums. We are now to fully realize a part of this problem that we face. But it all seems strangely remote and we're quite sure that the boys and girls of the next century will solve it all. If they solve it all, there's only one way they can solve it, and that is to go back to truth. Go back to the realities of things and find out why we are here. Well, many people think they know. Other people are quite certain there is no reason. Well, probably the great dominant today is that people do not believe there is a reason why we are here. We are simply the extension of a biological process. We go on because our ancestors propagated, and that's the beginning and end of everything. And if we are not careful, we will inherit the faults of our ancestors as part of our heredity. Actually, this is not the basis of anything. If this was the basis of anything, substantial or real, we would have a gradually accumulating development of material resources. If we had lived intelligently for the last 5,000 years, we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't be in the midst of a great power struggle. We would not be in the midst of a situation in which a country is perfectly willing to murder off half of its own population in order to accomplish a temporary political advantage. These things do not belong to a civilization that is going somewhere in the eyes of truth and God. Now then, we can also, in our way, begin to explore, explore these little matters and to discover in all the levels of life that success in living is the result of the discovery of the answer to the reason for existence. We must know why we are here. And we must realize that if we are here simply to die, we have already achieved the terminal condition. But we are not here simply to die. We are here because as human beings we cannot die. Because the source of us is eternal. The source of us is immortal. And we have created the fabric of mortality. We have transferred the rulership of life from the great powers of life to the little petty despots on our material and economic level. We do not belong to a physical order of life. We belong to an eternal law order of life that rises in the universe, that goes on and on and on to the fulfillment of its life. Behind the entire process of human existence is growth, evolutionary development, the constant enrichment of the inner life, the constant outgrowing of all old mistakes, the constant uh, visualizing of a tremendous destiny for which we are created. We are born to go past these planetary walls beyond the stars. We are here to live eternally in the light of truth, growth, and experience. We are here to become God-like, and when we become God-like, we will become with God. These things we know in our hearts, but we haven't the courage to live by them, and we live in a world that refuses to accept them. One of the most interesting steps, however, is the realization that is coming today that materialism politically is just as much of a mistake as it was scientifically. There is no way in which the world can become united except on integrities and ideals. And these are contrary to nearly all of the manipulations of policy. 
We are here because by truth we can grow. By error we become victims of our own mistakes. And the world we live in today is the punishment for the way we live in it. We have to face this. And to do this, we've got to begin to think a little more. But it's nice to read in the papers now and then, as recently, that there is a stirring in things. That there is a sudden recognition that old policies are not working. There's a recognition that the martyrs of the past, particularly the last 40 years, are really the heroes. They died for principles, and the thing that came and took their place without principles is a tragic disaster. Everywhere, the integrities are beginning to show. Now, integrities can also have a part in our personal lives. We have to know and realize that the financial foundation of life is purely symbolical. The, the financial system is of no value outside the walls of this planet. We could take all the banking and all the world out into space and it wouldn't be worth a dime. It is part of the peculiar miasma that we have created. It is part of the punishment we have inflicted upon ourselves by our own materiality. We have deified the unreal. Now we have to suffer from it. But the only answer must come finally that the entire process of controlling humanity by catering to ambition and wealth this entire process is wrong there's no need for it there never was any cause for it and all it did was take a beautiful garden a world that was made for our joy and peace and turning it into a vast concentration camp in which it is filled with the sorrows and miseries of people who are fighting they do not know for what winning and losing they know not what and go forward into the unknown, hoping for a better destiny without changing the causes of their own troubles. So we want to get a little bit into this idea a minute, that the answer to all problems of success is the accomplishment of what is necessary. And in this case, if necessity is anything in your life which is making you unhappy without any cause that you can understand. Anyone who has attached themselves to illusion suffers with it. Anyone who attaches themselves to the system which cannot succeed becomes part of a failure. Now we know that in between lives we escape from some of this and go back to a, a sphere of life in which integrities alone are real. But then we come back into this embodiment again and all these little things close in on us. As infants, we are brought up and weaned on materialism. We are taught to win at all costs. We are educated for big salaries. We are hopeful of high office. And we go along, and what do we have? Misery. And those in high office are just as miserable as those in low office. And there's a grave question, is there any difference between high office and low office? The only difference is the person in it. And the people in these offices are just as much subject to misery as those who fail to make the grade. So we have to start building a little bit, if we want to, on the realities with which we are faced. Failure to do so is to lose the advantage of a new century coming in. This new century is not a division, it's not a sharp line of demarcation. Of two-thirds of the people living today will part, take part in some part of the maturity of the next century. They will be born, they were born here, and when they're 12, 15 years old, or 20 years old, they will come into the new century. And if they come into the new century by merely projecting exactly what they are now, our next century will be exactly what it is now. Of course, there's one hope, that in, the, that in this situation, it's getting so bad now here that it may be that we will be forced to make certain basic changes in order to make the next century in any, any kind of a commendable form. We will just simply go on making the same mistakes as we have been making. I think we, can have, we will have to create a new concept of value, a concept of value that will have to be just as firm as a religion. Just as most people believe in God, 
we're going to have to find a, a, a system which believes in truth, believes in reality, believes in good. We cannot simply drift along without any solid belief except the paycheck without getting into continual difficulties. We have on the, sh on the borders of life at the moment these grave dangers of further military aggressions. And these will come probably unless we discover that the whole thing is a tempest in a teapot and that a great uh, political military objective such as World War II is just a group of frustrated people without any sense of right or wrong or without the courage to live what they might consider to be right, will become involved in a struggle which costs the lives of most of them and costs the future of the world. These things do not have to be. We don't like it when, the pro when wages are not high enough, so we strike. We do not like it when conditions are bow up, so we revolt. The time to come now is to revolt against the one great enemy, materialism. That to uh, revolt against the value of wealth as opposed to the reality of truth. Only by some such media as this can we start in. And have we one want to become a success in this search, we will have to be the ones who are able to discover the solution by means of which integrity becomes the answer to all the questions. We have to now start a little bit in our own way. Now, we don't, we're not going to be in a, such a bad shape if we do something about it. But if we wait until all the values are gone, then we are bound to have greater trouble. Wood is a good material. We're wasting it by the millions of square feet. But wood it is replaceable. Trees grow again if we don't take the land away from under them. But we're doing that too. We say we can replace them and then we cut down thousands of feet of them to build another town. We are not careful of these things. But with a little luck, some of these processes can be changed and adjusted. When, go when gasoline is gone, it is gone. There is no way of doing much to it. And it is estimated that we have more than a 40 year supply. And at the same time, we can't find a place to drive or anything else because the car is on the road. We are buying cars without any realization of what to do with them. They're all clogging us like uh, uh, some kind of uh, clogging material in an artery or a vein. We are creating a, an anabolism of one kind or another. The, the, we just simply tied ourselves up into a hopeless tangle. And this tangle is increasing. And another little point that's nice about it is that these advertisements for cars are getting more and more tempting. And now we are assured that you can have a car that is the ultimate in comfort, the ultimate in luxury, the ultimate in beauty, and that you can go a hundred miles on, the, on this machine without even feeling the road underneath. <laughs> you are practically flying. But what are we flying to? Why are we in such a hurry? Are the people we're going to see really worth all that? <laughs> and if we're going home, are we that anxious to get there? <laughs> no, this, this, this is what? The complete way of making sure that we're going to have no fuel. And we are told that while there are small still areas where we may find it, we wonder sometimes whether or not that we are taking fuel out of the earth in a kind of... Uh, a transfusion process. Are we taking the lifeblood of the planet? That oil is here for a reason. If we destroy it completely, or make it where it can't replace itself, and it can't, what is going to happen? Little by little. Has this something to do with changes in climate? Has this something to do with the mysterious forces of earthquakes? Are these things simply the individual continuing to deplete natural resources without necessity. We don't need the car that is practically twice the length of the, of the uh, garage. We don't need all these wonderful luxuries. I remember long ago they built an automobile with a bar in the back of the front seat. We don't need that, really. 
with our present alcoholic rules on driving, that wouldn't be very successful. But the point is, here we go, selling something that is taking the life blood out of our resources. We are not in any position at the present name to know that we can have a, re as a substitute. And will the substitute be more dangerous than what we have? And if it is more dangerous, will we do it anyway, simply because we must have the substitute? All these things go on and on and on. So we now face a, a very definite problem. We, think, we look forward to a new century in which many of these problems should and could work out to the advantage of all mankind. But they will not work out unless the people who move into the 21st century have a different basic attitude toward life. Unless they learn from the sorrows of the 20th century, they will not be able to save the 21st century. We cannot do it by simply projecting our mistakes, by maintaining at all costs a standard of living that was never sensible, never necessary. The idea that we have to have more is not necessarily the answer to the problem. We could also have it might cost less. We might not find it necessary to make all these sacrifices of integrity and honesty if we were satisfied to live as we should live. Now, if we want to see how, to, how should we live, that's another question. And I imagine there is an answer for that by each person, and it'll be a little different in all. But the substance of the matter is very basic. We are basically are here to grow, to learn, and to live. We were put here by a power that is greater than ourselves for reasons that we do not fully understand. But we have received missions and wisdoms to give us a fair foundation as to what it's all about. We are here for a purpose. And if we fulfill that purpose, we will live in peace. If we do not fulfill that purpose, we will live in misery and maybe shorten our lives more than is absolutely necessary. So if we can go into the next future, the next generation or the next century for that matter, with a little different attitude, we can mold things before they get set again. If we move our present population into a better environment or a greater potential of environment, perhaps we can move it into something important. If we take them into the 21st century and we tell them, frankly, we're out of gas, so let's forget all about that. And we are in need of a major change in our entire system of nutrition. We have to eat to live and not live to eat. We have to do something worthwhile with the food. What is the use of feeding an individual who is no good, either hungry or full? The time has come when food is part of the material necessary for growth. It is not simply a luxury. It is something that we must use in order to do something with life. To feed something that is doing nothing and going nowhere is not part of nature's plan. Nature wants things to be used to advance the causes of life and to advance the realities of life. And if we will advance these realities, we will be protected. We also will find when we go into the next century that there is nothing reasonable about war. What is the use of it? What does it do? It is a continual scourge upon the face of the earth. It is constantly devouring resources. It is shortening the pages of history in order to take care of modern grudges. And what is behind it all? Ambition. The individual struggle of power. The struggle of the individual who really can never have more than an important monument in the graveyard. No one can win. The, we, the great world conqueror goes down to the dust with the humblest of his victims. So why start it in the first place? Why should an individual who is short of life spend a, most of his time trying to be better and become in the end too tired to live? All these things are part of the question of what is success? And we know that finally success is actually the final discovery and application of the laws of what is necessary. Necessity is the great need. And this necessity is for peace, for friendship, for fellowship, 
for understanding. It is a peace that can never be justified by the str struggles and confusions of our present life. In, nine, in the 20th century, we lived the most dangerous life and the most dangerous century in the history of mankind. There is no proof that the 20th century really picked us up into a higher standard of consciousness. It simply made us more money conscious and it subjected us to the grabbings of ambitious rulers and uh, potentates of one kind or another. So we have to get ready for this. So let's see now how we're going to do this, a little bit of it. First of all, we can uh, prevent the further escalation of some of our mistakes. It is not necessary for anybody to drive a brand new car every year for the rest of his life. And there is no need for the ones he has left behind to clog the, the streets and roads of every country on earth. There is no reason why it should be any different with a car than it was with a horse and buggy. When you bought a good horse, you used it. You were good to the horse. You took care of it. You made sure that it had all its needs. And if it got sick, you sent for a veterinary. Every time a horse didn't need, feel good or needed a new shoe, we didn't take it out and trade it off. We got it fixed up and put it back. And in the course of time, our children and our children and the children loved that horse. And the old Betty lived all along and finally went out to pasture. All these things were very simple and couldn't cost much. But now that's, that would be terrible. Oh, we, should, we have no time for things like that. And that brings another problem. What have we time for? We have no time for anything, <laughs> particularly hard work. That is a very disruptive figure. Why do we have so little time? Well, because there are so many things to do. One of them is to spend four hours a night at the television. That is really changing the course of history for the worse. Then we have other things. We have telephone calls that go on for hours every day. We have trips here and trips there. We have all kinds of social conflict. We have all kinds of political conferences. We have almost everything you can think of except a little rest. We, couldn't, we don't need any of these things. They are taking the time which we should be used doing something of permanent value. We should not be getting rid of the children by sticking them in front of television. All of these changes must come. The individual must gradually realize that a well-planned life is important. Now, of course, you can always tell him or let him think that he is really wasting time because if he's a good man or a bad man, he's going to be equally dead when the time comes. But this isn't actually true. If he were equally dead, if we were any of us dead, we would not have been created. God does not create death. God does realize that death is a shadow. It is a break in the continuity of things in order to break up impasses that humanity itself hasn't the strength to change. By putting an interval between, we move people into new environments, but nobody dies. But everybody who fails to do something with life comes back without the qualities and conditions he should have developed. So regardless of whether there's a future in it or not, we have a perfect right to use what we call time as usefully and helpfully as possible. And it should be a happy use. Nature never made it necessary to make misery the basis of growth. It is human beings who make so much trouble that their misery forces growth upon them. But growth can be achieved gloriously and happily and healthily. It can be a vicarious process or it can be a conscious process. But whatever it is, it is the opportunity to be a little more tomorrow than we are today in essential values. Better friends, better families, better loved ones, better children. All these things can grow. And growth is the secret of life. Growth is what we are here for. And as long as we grow, we are safe. If we stop growing, it becomes necessary for nature to give us a swift kick because growth must go on. And if we do not voluntarily grow, 
then we must have it forced upon us. If we grow vicariously, we also have to realize the dangers of being unhappy because we're not doing the things we wanted to do, the reason being that we shouldn't have wanted to do them. If nature does not take away from us anything of value, it only separates us from the unvalued or that which is without value and which we have allowed to take over the rulership of our lives. We are here to get ready for the next generation. We're getting ready ourselves. Many people living now are going to live in the next century. They're going to live in a new environment of a kind. But if we continue to let the old slop over into the new, we can destroy its integrity. When we step across, there should be a really good reason. <clears throat> now I think that good reason is in the making. We are seeing around us all the time now an increasing realization that something is desperately wrong. We are beginning to recognize that materialism was a dead loss. We are beginning more and more to recognize that wealth is a desperate evil problem. It is a problem that has destroyed more than it has created. And some of the poorest people in the world are those who are wealthy. The wealth has become a blind alley. It is a going nowhere. It is something that is a false start and a false finish. And as surely as we gain it over the years of living, we must leave it behind when we go. There is no way of carrying it for them. And that in itself is the proof of its values and its lack of value. Wealth is something in moderate amounts may help us to live back more conveniently and more artistically and more helpfully in our world. But as an end in itself, it is a dead loss. And it is a dead mistake to believe that, that wealth is power. Because in nature there's only one power, and that is the power of good. Evil has no power. Evil is not something that is struggling like a horn-tailed de demon to destroy us. The evil, so-called, is simply our own self-centeredness in which we try to believe or want to believe that it is possible for us to build heaven on earth, that it is possible for us to have everything we want, no responsibilities, and no interest in other people. Well, nature doesn't allow this. It's not part of the principle. It's not something that was intended. And as a result of that, we can't succeed in it. But now we see new people coming along. We see new organizations coming along, trying to solve things. We find reforms breaking out all over. We are beginning to subconsciously receive the impulses and impressions that nature is sending with the promise of another century in which to achieve something more. We, this century could be set aside as one of the great failures as far as humanity is concerned. There is really no experience, really no value in it. All the inventions, all the wonderful discoveries, all the subtles and the, all the missiles and everything you can think of, they're all a heap of dead loss. The only thing that is valuable is that experience and the uh, constant flow of conditions will help us to discover the basic friendships and integrities by which we can go on without war and gradually reduce crime get rid of narcotics and take care of the various socialist problems simply by the realization that we don't need them. This isn't a great big deal. But if more people become individually free from the temptations which cause compromise, we will find that little by little the peoples of nations will gradually become sufficiently aware of value to influence the elections of their leaders or to create a new system of appointment. We can gradually take the ulterior motives out of government by developing integrities. And if, if we did not succumb to temptations on some level, we would not be having a poor government at any time. So we have to find out a little bit about nature's plan. We must say to ourselves, what is the real plan behind all this? Well, it seems to me that probably the ancients were pretty well. But finally, 
This world is a school. It is a place of learning. You turn in your papers and have them graded. And if you're particularly good, you get a better mark. If you're particularly poor, you may have to do the grade over again. But it probably is all education. And education is the release from the, within the individual of the divine and soul power with which he is endowed. The purpose of education is to make the best part of man ruler of the rest. The, when the individual is governed not by the mind or the body, but by the soul. When the inside in its integrities dominates the outside, we will have the same thing in society. We will have a society of people living simply, living reasonably, but living happily because they are fulfilling the useful things of life. They're not dodging responsibilities. They're not hipped up on hot rock music. They are not caught in narcotics. They are not caught in all of the dissipations and immoralities that are affecting our present generation. They are doing things that are interesting and valuable because the inside is being expressed. As it is now, we all have inside. We all have soul power. We all have soul consciousness. But we're not doing very much with it. We allow it to be obscured by every temptation that comes along. We allow ourselves to fall into emotional stress. We allow ourselves to make a strange kind of happiness supreme when this happiness doesn't really make us happy at all. No one is happy because he's intoxicated. Actually, it is defiance, frustration, indifference. It is the realization or belief that there are no values in life. There are values in life and always have been. And it's not until we recognize these values that we will begin to live safely. And it is very important at this time that each person begins to control and direct he must say to himself, what makes me happy? What is it that is really making me have a good time? And if we find out that we are happier after we have three or four drinks, then we know where our problem lies. And we know that it's going to be there until we cure. And we also know, as I've tried to tell a number of alcoholics, that if that is their problem, and they pay no attention to it, they will must face delirium tremens and the misery of a terrible death. It is a little so-called happiness, which is nothing but an escape mechanism with the shoulder of the person with a miserable period of living, in which he is trying to escape and forget himself. It would be much better for all concerned if he remembered himself, and remembered his potential, and did what he could to build up something out of it all. So all this faults and phony happiness we talk about is not real is not making anybody happy homes are at a very low ebb a business is at very low ethics and government is at very low knowledge everything is a little bit off nothing is so and why should we therefore build a vast structure to perpetuate that which has failed why should we vote enthusiastically for the continuation of a condition that had been out wrong and outmoded for hundreds of years. Why were uh, we trying to maintain what the Roman Empire gave up as a bad job? Why should we make the same kind of mistake that left nothing but pyramids in the sands of Egypt? Why should we go on right on with the same type of fighting, discording that we had in Europe in the Renaissance? Everybody out for everybody. Religious persecution, political chicanery, economic injustice. We do these terms from just as much now as we, they were then. We've got to change this. We've got to make it better by gradually becoming masters of our own lives. <clears throat> and one thing we can do, every one of us, is to take our own life and chart it. We can begin with the realization that if though there be a thousand who fall upon the right hand and a thousand may fall upon the left hand the just man shall not be moved if we do what is right ourselves we are not responsible for civilization's mistakes but we can be right as we try 
And the moment we are right, we begin to contribute to the rightness of others. Once we get ourselves set up in the proper relation, we can contribute to the well-being of all those we come in contact with. So we are not really selfish. No one is selfish because he's right. No one is selfish because he tries to live proper principles. He is selfish if he tries to take on the rights and privileges of other people, when that is the one thing he doesn't want. What he wants is that the integrities of nature shall take over the government of mankind. This is what is necessary. This is the thing we need desperately to develop. So we say that this is part of the new century, that the century is there is evidence coming. There are more groups arising now interested in mysticism and these problems than ever before. For once in the time of, certainly in modern times, we find references to mysticism and idealism and parapsychology and other things in the academic field. We find more and more the universities reaching out. Why? Because they can't stand it either. They don't be, uh, I've talked to a number of the of educated people, so-called. They're all miserable. They, they haven't found anything that's an answer. They find that they are hollow. That the mother, who is a good parapsychologist, doesn't know what to tell her children. That the man who is way up in physics doesn't know what to do when his own son becomes delinquent. These things have no solution on the level of the error. They must be solved on a higher level than they are caused. <clears throat> we must have the answer as to be better on principle and integrities than the question. And this is quite possible. And it is coming. I think we will find that there is more movement in this direction in the last ten years than there's been in the previous hundred. We are all searching for something better. It is no longer a disgrace to admit that we don't know. It is a disgrace, however, if we don't know, to have to admit we are doing nothing about it. So there is something to do. That's what we've been trying to do for years, and what I think other people are working with, desperately to help people to recognize that we are individually responsible for keeping the principles we know to be true. And then as far as possible, we will keep these principles in a kindly manner. We will not condemn the rights of others, but we shall so live that other people will see the advantage of our beliefs. They will, we will prove by our own lives that we are working with the plan instead of against it. And as the time goes on, more and more will come. And this thing that the uh, communists refer to as the masses, and the masses is a strange term, but the masses is a name we give to anybody who isn't in public office. We give it to anybody who is part of the great working population of the world. The masses, whom we are sometimes a little worried about, sometimes we are a little frightened about them, but anyway, the masses. This is the problem. If the masses themselves must be the ones who change the situation. The masses are the ones who are still uh, untouched by wealth. They wish they had it. They do anything, maybe commit crime to get it. But they have not been completely infected by it. And in this case, they can be used very into well. Because the, the simplicity of the masses is an integrity this great mass of so-called untutored may be merely a term to boil to mean the great mass that has not been spoiled. They have not the sophistication. They have the hunger. They need, the, they need a rope over their heads. They need uh, funds for their children. They need a job. Many of them want a better education. But they are basically the human beings who have a realization of what is absolutely necessary. They are the ones that have suffered most from political power. They are the ones who have suffered most from religious tyranny. And they are also the ones, perhaps more than any of them, who have suffered from the downgrading of their estate by their own fellow human beings. 
Therefore, I think that somewhere in the masses they will not answer again to the cry of, of socialism, will come to recognize that in their keeping is a great possibility of bringing about some of the changes that we desperately need. A good father and mother with two or three children may not have much money, may have to struggle, may we lose a job, but they are the ones who can be the salt of the earth. They are the ones who have every reason to want to be better. And if they can find a way of being better, they are apt to prove that they will be organizing better to forward the new course of life than all the intelligentsia put together. So if a great, one, one great thing might be that the rise of the masses of people in trouble, people in sorrow, people in need, that this tremendous mass making up nine-tenths of human beings will find that the great need is for their improvement. That is that the time has come when the Christian faith shall apply to the little people, when the power to do right becomes the one power that the poor still have. It is quite possible for the poor and those who have less to recognize the possibility of bringing about the great changes that we so desperately need. At least we hope that something of that nature will produce the changes that must come one of these days. So we want to try to understand that the answer to the problem is to recognize the need to stop what hurts and start moving toward what heals. That we, there is no use trying to fight out the, the pressures and problems of the past. There is no need for another Roman Empire. There is no need for another Napoleonic Empire. There is not any need for another empire of Adolf Hitler. What there is really need is the rise of those benevolent souls who have become the great teachers and leaders of human progress. The time has come for the peaceful to stand as examples of what is necessary. We cannot survive another nuclear war. And there is no need to. But what we have got to do is to recognize that the universe is ruled by a divine power. That this power will guarantee that nothing will cease and nothing will truly end. But this power cannot reward evil with good. This power must be remaining in its own integrity. It must therefore say that if the game of chess is played too badly, the great power will come in, sweep all the pieces back into the box again, and start a new game. And this is the thing we would like to be able to say when the new game comes, we are it. That we are doing the things that are going to accomplish what we so desperately need. If we can understand this better, we have a, different, a better reason to look for more interesting things. The wonders and beauties of life, the greatness of the arts coming into form, better music, better education, clearer and simpler and more just religion, use, use law, laws that are fair to all, and the possibility of a new aristocracy, an aristocracy which is superior only in the fact that it is wiser and better, and therefore it is the natural leader of the world. And this aristocracy will never pervert, never corrupt, but will go down as the ancients knew, as the sages, the wise ones, the good ones. And they are the only ones that will not disappear in the waste of time. They will go on. And the great citizens of the world are the teachers, the wise and the loving. And when we depart from them, we depart from truth. And when we depart from truth, we open ourselves to the adversities of our own making. And that we don't want to have happen again. We do not want to have another century of struggle, fighting, bickering. What we want is a century that grows up 
where friendship, love, and kindness become the great powers in the establishment of human relationships. Well, that's it. <laughs>